introduce uh, Philip Block to you, and uh, I will read some of the information because uh, I couldn't learn that from the people that I had. He's an architect and he's an engineer. And uh, he's assistant professor since 2009 at the Institute of Technology in Architecture at the ATH in Zurich, where he directs the Block Research Group which focuses on equilibrium analysis of measuring blocks and computational role finding and fabrication of closed surface structure. Um, what, I, what I thought was uh, extremely interesting when I did my homework and I was looking at watching some videos on YouTube um, was that the initial moment uh, um, was a kind of the puzzle by the mastery that I the knowledge of a craft-based architectural or constructive tradition that people had in Gothic architecture. And um, this is what we've been just talking about. King's College Chapel was seemingly one of the initial moments where he tried to understand how this uh, construction was possible. Now he tries to abstract and to understand what these people have known more or less by instinct and by also some calculation and drawings and uh, try to put this into computer software in order to make this fruitful for the future. So I think this is a kind of uh, very, very constructive uh, historic research research into advanced and very coverage structure made mainly out of bricks, shells and surfaces that initiates from a historic research and goes on to make this fruitful time. Um, yes, so you actually conquered my introductory slides, I think, about King's College and all that, but I will nonetheless go on. Um, well, thanks all for coming and not going to the fashion show. I might have done something else myself, but uh, nonetheless, I will try to make it easy. Um, so yes, I think uh, we can uh, learn uh, from the master builders, from the builders in the past, and I will specifically I will focus on uh, the design potential that comes from learning from uh, those skills that we're in <coughs> and how we can do exciting things uh, a new now, or design better perhaps. So just an overview, I'll show first that actually um, I want to emphasize that I will not show any equation. I think this would not be the right audience and I never think this equations are perhaps boring uh, to show. But um, uh, we, I also do this professionally. I actually um, analyze historic structures. So why are they standing and how long are they standing and what needs to happen to them before they collapse. So I just want to say that this is really where it comes from. It's not an aesthetic understanding or that, but it's, it's more uh, really um, uh, why are all these beautiful Gothic vaults still standing? Then I'll, sh I'll show how you can uh, translate these analysis tools to then uh, have new design tools, and then uh, it gets exciting. I will show you um, how you can then, uh, if you understand good structural form, uh, that you can design with very little or low quality material or in the other direction, you can design both uh, expressive and efficient at the same time. And I hope that to surprise you at the end and to show that what I am showing you is perhaps masonry for me as a vehicle, but that uh, we can really learn from masonry, from brick, from stone, and so on to do things in any type of material. So All right. So first, understanding these historic vaults, and there it is, King's College. Uh, the fan vault at uh, King's College at the University of Cambridge. I don't know if you've seen these already live. Uh, perhaps you don't realize that uh, these are, well, you certainly realize that these are unreinforced stone structures, so that means they're large slabs, pieces of stone that are just kept in compression. There is no steel, there is no plastic wrapping it or carbon fiber, things like that. So these are uh, just balanced in space uh, in compression. Um, another, some other uh, aspects about these uh, shells are that they are only 10 centimeters at mid span and they go to 15 centimeters. Uh, the span is almost 14 meters. 
And so, um, if that doesn't mean anything, these kind of proportions, perhaps this image might. These shells are actually literally the same proportion as an eggshell. And so they're just, remember, they're just stones that are uh, kept in compression. So to me, that is not only mind-boggling, uh, uh, but it's also a real challenge uh, for uh, engineers to explain why they stand. So that is where the research comes from. Um, another reason why I do this kind of work is because uh, if we don't have the right tools or approaches or methods as engineers to understand these structures, then very sad things like this happens. What you're looking at is uh, in the Met in New York, they had these beautiful tile vaults, vaulted spaces, and they were replaced by a typical uh, beam system because the engineer at the time could not explain why the shells were standing. It's then very ironic and uh, a pity that they had to take them down with jackhammers, like really heavy machinery, because obviously these beautiful sh uh, shells didn't want to go. Perhaps the engineer should have looked at the the tests of the Moscovinos, so I'll talk about them more. Uh, below there you see actually a little shell hidden, and you see the very uh, quiet load bearing capacity of these kind of structures. So how do these structures work? So bear with me, this will take maximum five minutes, but I'll insist on explaining why these things work, and then I'll show you some examples. There's two extreme ways of looking at structures. Uh, one is to look like in modern structure, you try to have everything at full stress. So that is a material problem. So you try to really optimize all the elements that you use the material as much as you can. But that is uh, a problem that you cannot scale. Uh, this is a drawing by Galilei, where he shows the bone of a dog and a bone of an elephant. These are uh, type of problems are not scalable. The master builders, actually, uh, this was mentioned in the introduction, were actually lucky. It was not only intuition, but they were also uh, lucky that when you talk about good structural form, I will do this a lot because this is actually arch action, is a good structural form in compression. Uh, then uh, it is a problem of stability about equilibrium, and that is mainly a geometrical problem. So they could use, as you see in the bottom right, uh, proportional drawings. Uh, so proportional rules, but also if they saw that the church worked at a small scale, they scaled it up and it still worked and it still worked. And uh, that is because of a very specific type of problem we're dealing with. They also actually, these are some drawings of some plaster models. They actually also used uh, scaled models to uh, test their new designs and what would happen. Alright, so if you, now we have the tools to look at this. Um, I will not go into detail, but what we can use is a truss line. This is a theoretical line that visualizes where the compressive forces want to run through space. So if you have loads, then you can show where the forces are going. Now, what is very powerful about limit analysis is that if you find a compression solution that stays within the geometry of your structure, then you can say that it's stable. So this is great. Because this very hard problem of explaining why the structure is still standing can be translated into a geometrical one. You probably all know this uh, way to generate a compressive line. It's by inverting the geometry of a hanging chain. The hanging chain is in uh, pure tension. So if you freeze this geometry and you flip it for the same loading case, it will be for, from a static point of view in pure compression. It's very painful to make models, so there is graphic statics, for example, allowed to uh, do this on paper. And indeed, this was used a lot. So this is um, here in the 30s. This was um, in um, a loading, a very complex loading case with wind and all kinds of other things. Um, they were trying to find this one line that stayed within the geometry, and then that was sufficient to explain that it was stable. Of course, if you go to sophisticated shells like these, uh, again I reinforce, this is the Geronimus uh, monastery, then we need a three-dimensional approach. I'll skip this, uh, I'll just show that in order to find, uh, to explain again that this is stable, this will not work with just 2D arches. So here you need a fully 3D solution, and we develop techniques to generate these kind of force patterns that map exactly the inside surface such a shell, and then this will come back later. Uh, I do this based on graphical methods. I don't know if any of you know uh, uh, any any of you know graphic statics. I'm just curious, uh, who knows graphic statics? Uh, one, two, three, four. 
all right? So perhaps uh, you should be learning graphic statics, but uh, this, this method is uh, based on that. So to wrap up uh, the historical, we use this, uh, it's exciting to be able to save structures like these uh, by applying our 3D methods that uh, where the, the other engineers or the clients were already wrapping the structure with steel, thanks to now these three-dimensional methods, we can explain that they stand. As I said, masonry is particularly a problem of stability. So uh, to the left, you see again these plaster models where they apply differential settlements to the supports because they were not that great yet in geotechnical engineering. And for this, we have this lab at ETH where we uh, basically apply to 3D printed models. Remember, when it is a problem about stability, it is fundamentally a geometrical problem. You cannot scale everything, but most of the behavior, the collapse mechanisms, you can really scale. And so we use them, we develop this table where we can apply these differential settlements to start to really understand um, uh, how uh, uh, masonry structures want to collapse and to inform our, um, our digital tools. So this was then applied for a Native Amer uh, 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 American uh, cliff dwelling in New Mexico and where we basically um, then uh, check different collapse mechanisms. I'm showing this because that is really the foundation, that's the base, that's where it comes from and uh, already the tools, how we develop them. So a three-dimensional extension of graphical methods and in this case a more uh, uh, precise control of uh, scale models is exactly the same methods that the uh, old master builders use. All right, so let's now see what we can do with this. So for example, let's say that we have this design problem. We have a, a very simple circle, it's a full support along, and you want to generate a shape that is in pure compression in between. So what you can imagine, a simple dome can happen, a dome with an opening. Well, in fact, there is really an infinite number of uh, solutions. The, all these solutions have been um, generated with a free tool that we developed from our research, Rhino Vault, I'll show you this later. But this just to say that these are all possible pure compressive structures with a circular background. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that um, that is what we are after, by really understanding 3D equilibrium, by really staying within this extremely rigid constraint, pure compression, so you could build any of these shapes out of discrete pieces of stones, they will stand in compression, and uh, so what can you really achieve? So graphical methods, I will then not emphasize this too much, but what was great about the graphical methods is that the design of the geometry was always connected to the design of the distribution of forces. And so this combined information allowed a lot of master builders to do very exceptional stuff. In 3D, this became very uh, tricky, so you had to, because you were stuck to the 2D dra uh, drawing plane. And so that is also no surprise that people like Gaudi still went to the most powerful, the analog computer, to the hanging chain model with the uh, weights that correspond to the weights that he imagined that would come. Um, you perhaps know that this was the model of the crypt of the Colonia Goel. He only used this technique for, uh, for one project because it took his team 10 years to design this and uh, we can all agree that perhaps modern clients uh, don't have the patience to wait for 10 years for this great visionary design. So perhaps that's why I did my PhD to help Gaudi a little bit if he uh, would still be around. Alright, then uh, we implemented these kind of ideas in Rhino Vault. Um, the point of Rhino Vault is not to compete with uh, Kanamba, not to compete with uh, Kangaroo, not to compete with all these hanging, and very, uh, hanging models and very exciting tools that are around, but really to force the designer to use to the left is the layout of forces, to the right is the distribution of forces. To really use these two informations to know what he's doing. So, for example, um, here to the right, we will attract forces by literally making the lengths of the elements that represent the forces in the system longer. And when you attract forces in a certain direction, it means that you will have a, a crease, that you will have an arch. Um, you all understand this if you have a hanging chain with the same loads, a deeper structure, you don't pull a lot. For a very shallow structure, you need to pull a lot.
fault. So here we do the inverse. We actually steer our geometry in order to be able to um, tell it where the forces need to go, where the stiffnesses need to be. And so you can directly see visually, you have the explicit control of both the geometry and the forces to start to design. This example is loosely inspired by Stuttgart 21. Uh, first, you can see that this is a simple shell with openings. But then if we don't change the horizontal equilibrium of forces at all, but we change the boundary conditions, so we change the supports, then you see that we get these beautiful uh, eye-like or these drop-like openings uh, that is a key feature of IOTO. So this is a shape that, uh, at least for the self-weight that we form find it for, uh, that would work in, uh, in compression only. Of course, this is only form finding. There is a lot of engineering that needs to follow on that. Uh, typically, I typically say that the people in Stuttgart should have invited me so that there uh, would not be the need for so much steel in the structure. But that is, of course, unfair because um, this is only form finding. Alright, so let's now see how we can use this tool. So, when you know about good structural form, when you know where the forces are going, I, I already said you can design with little or, or low quality material. So, I'll give you um, uh, examples of the three main methods that you can span space in masonry. To the left, you have a very uh, typical European uh, tradition with a full forward, so full centering. You place all the bricks on top, then you lower it, and then the shell stands. The one in the middle uh, is uh, a pitch brick technique, came from Egypt and then in Mexico, and we'll talk about that. And the last one is steel tile vaulting. The benefit of the last two is that they can be built in space without any formwork, so that is very powerful. You don't have to invest in all this material to lay out all your stones on. So let's first go to the last uh, uh, technique, tile vaulting. The Mediterranean, uh, uh, in Spain, it was really pushed. Um, it is basically, when you have boundary conditions, it uses a fast setting mortar, a gypsum based mortar, to basically place a tile and it temporarily cantilevers until you create a stable section. So you need to know where the, the stable geometry is at the end, but the first layer is done uh, through cantilevering temporarily. And then this first layer that is done with this facet in order that serves as a loss, a permanent framework to build up structural depth between other layers of tiles that come in different angles. In the, uh, in the United States, there's a lot of beautiful examples. The Costavinos emigrated there, and this is, for example, in the Bronx Zoo. Um, this is uh, in uh, the Oyster Bar, of course, in Grand Central Terminal. So if you look, walk around in the US and you see this kind of, they call it herring bone pattern. Actually, what you're looking at is an unreinforced masonry tile vault of typically 15 centimeters, so three layers of tile. And on top of that, they're all built without any forward. So they're just built, as I showed you, in space. So what's impressive about this is that they could go up to 30, even sometimes 40 meters. For example, the main hall of Grand Central Terminal is an unreinforced masonry. So unreinforced means no steel, no helmet whatsoever. It's just compression. Standing here, another beautiful example, and um, all these structures are now being celebrated in the United States. I really like these uh, shell structures, they are also tile vaults, also unreinforced, also built without any formwork. Um, so they're just uh, two layers of tin tiles, they're basically like bathroom tiles uh, that they built in this typical one. No surprise that the Mastodinos were pretty awesome at what they did they were masters in graphic studies indeed. So I will not make too much publicity, but it's a, it's a great way to go about. Alright, so that's the technique. So we have had a chance to use this in several projects. Um, still, uh, during my PhD at MIT, I was involved in this project. It's in South Africa. It's a project by Peter Rich and John Oxenberg. Um, it's uh, this um, um, interpretive center, this museum. Uh, in, in, uh, in, in a very distant location in, Ma uh, in Mapungubwe in South Africa. Um, the great thing about the project is actually that the location and the conditions of the project demanded almost a compression solution because it was a poverty relief program, so it meant that the local community had to be engaged. 
and also there was a strong emphasis on using local materials because the site was so distant that they didn't want to bring out typical materials. So during one year, the people without any energy, 12 people in the community were pressing these tiles. So what we're talking about is this is a very typical technique to make uh, wall elements, big blocks to f make non-structural wall elements. So in this case, by stabilizing the soil with only 7% of cement, they could actually press these very thin tiles that would be used for the final tile. Um, why are the women carrying the tiles? This is an anecdote I recently uh, learned about because uh, the tiles were designed for only 2 megapascals in compression, so that is actually not a lot. But if you take this tile that is about 25 centimeters and you hold it on one end, it directly snaps in bending, so it has no bending capacity whatsoever. So it's really a very uh, weak material, that's what I mean by weak or low quality material. So the women had to carry these tiles because the men were too brute force, and by the time they arrived on site, already half of them were broken, so that was not uh, the good way to do it. So on the bottom left, you see Michael and James Bellamy uh, training. Uh, people that were a week before that, carpenters and farmers and so on. So that's another great thing about these kind of methods, that they have a very low threshold. So this is the very first fault that these uh, uh, new laborers, new masons uh, were building. This is very traditional tile vaulting. You first build the boundary conditions on full uh, forward, so the arches, and then all the rest you can patch without the need of any form. So why all the wood there then? This is actually to describe the geometry of this compressive shell very carefully because you, we are basically working with non-skilled laborers. Then because this is uh, just dirt, compressed soil, compressed earth, the, the shell had to be waterproofed very carefully, otherwise there would be no shell left. And uh, then for architectural reasons, uh, these stones were placed on top to integrate better in the landscape. But actually for a compressive shell, this is a very good thing because it adds a very uh, heavy uh, dominant self-weight so that a live loading is less important, so that you keep nicely the compressive forces where they need to be. So here an overview of this. So you start with the boundary conditions and then the rest can be done um, without fault. So here you see how thin you can go, particularly the one to the right is impressive. These are these weak tiles, the same tiles, and if you know where the forces are going, then you can build something. And these are some of the results. So to be clear, I was not part of the design team, but I did the uh, structural analysis of all the faults. Um, then coming to ETH, I translated some of these concepts and to try to go one more step uh, beyond that, to address in Ethiopia the problem of low-cost uh, housing. This is the so-called low-cost housing now. There's nothing low-cost about it, it's just heavily subsidized. They're just trying to mimic how we build things. We build in concrete, reinforced concrete. They don't have cement, they don't have steel, they don't have uh, precision formwork. You see that they are not using the wood in the best possible way. None of this will be uh, reused. This will all be burned afterwards. Um, so that is the, that was the premise. So we looked at this floor system that was already uh, used in the in the South Africa project. So it's basically a compressive shell, and then the concrete floor could then be uh, built without the need of ten, uh, tension reinforcement. So there is no reinforcement except for the one that controls the cracks. Um, so this is not a new technique, so if you look at the Guastavinos, they had this system where the thin shells were stiffened either by vertical walls or by filling it with a stabilized soil. Of course, it also helps to come to the level 4, and uh, because it was really the idea to copy this model, module, we wanted to be very clear where these shapes come from. It's not just the curved shape, it's actually the hanging chain, the catenary, is where the geometry comes from. And then uh, with very simple guides, you see you can then describe this geometry. We chose for a single curvature shell, which is easy to describe, but which is actually a very bad structural form, so I'll explain this. Um, but 
Another challenge, the project took about two years because it was, we didn't just want to come in with an idea and then leave again, that's the most dangerous thing you can do. So we had to train people, explain that as you don't want to build in areas uh, where there's a, a lot of seismicity, they also needed to understand what materials were appropriate to be built in Earth. So here, there you see these stiffening walls. The reason for this is that a single curvature fault is actually not a good compressive shell. You actually want positive double curvature. Imagine if you have a live load, a point load, then you can imagine different arches going to the support if you have a nice positive double curvature. In single curvature, all the forces need to go in one direction, so that is not good. So the stiffness allowed to make more structural depth. And then to even stabilize that, we filled the entire floor, so we combined the two systems of the Guastavinos with a line stabilized pumice, so that is a volcanic rock. So this is then, at the end, what you get is you get one big package of basically rammed soil where compressive forces can go in any direction, even though the former was just single turtle. I'm not responsible for the stair, but this is the inside. And for the top floor, so we use pile vaulting to not lose a lot of space in the floor height. And for the top floor, which is exposed, uh, exposed to the elements, we wanted a good doubly curved shell. So we use this technique. It comes from Nubian vaulting from Egypt. In Mexico, they did a very beautiful adaptation of this. So they start in the corner and they lean with the bricks. And um, I just sent actually the paper of a friend of mine, and two weeks later this shell was built. This is Adobe brick, so no cement whatsoever, and Adobe mortar. So that is, that is beautiful about this technique, that it is, you can build it without formwork again, and you can build it with very rudimentary materials. So this was Alfonso Ramirez Ponce, uh, who built these shells in Mexico, and he was the one that basically uh, sent the information. To the right, since it was a prototype, of really showing uh, how to build differently. Um, we also use a technique known in Mexico where they have fermented cactus. So they mix it, so it's basically rotting cactus. And this is one stage we, we, we formed, uh, something equivalent to tequila. And so the anecdote is that they were mixing these kind of things. They, the barrel fell over and they saw that it was impermeable from that point onwards. So then they thought, ah, maybe let's smash this on buildings, and actually this works really well. So this is a natural sealant, a natural blue, blue, and then this was the results. So it is a very boxy, kind of boring thing, but that is exactly what they wanted. This was designed by an Ethiopian architect. So this is a modern structure to them. So we wanted to show this is 90% uh, uh, local soil, and it looks nonetheless boxy. More importantly, um, this was final cost at the end. It came out to be 65 euros per square meter, entirely finished. The reason that it is so, uh, so cheap is because we use literally the dirt on site and uh, we're cheating perhaps a little bit. Uh, labor is practically for free in Ethiopia, so that's another reason that this is so cheap. So at the end you can compress anything you want, like our buddy Wally, to start uh, constructing stuff. And in the summer, we built a large shell in just compressed paper. Uh, the reason that they have these beautiful colors is that these are the uh, forms that you have to hand in with your diploma. And they have yellow, orange, and white. So this is a nice trace of all the suffering at ETH. I will get something beautiful um, out of it. All right, so that is what you can do when you, when you know where forces want to go. But you can also go beyond that, as I suggested with my design tools earlier. For me, this was the first time I was triggered, I, was, I saw such a shell. Uh, to the left, we already saw the Guasavinos, to the right. Um, this guy is Michael Ramage, you remember him maybe from South Africa project. Uh, this was for his master thesis uh, at MIT. He built this little shell, one layer shell, and as you can see, very, uh, very convincingly carrying half a ton of MIT nerds. So that was for me a very convincing uh, uh, first uh, step. John Oxendorf was then called, I heard that he was a vault builder, he said yes, and this was the very second project that Michael did, it's a 30 meter dome um, uh, uh, in tile vaulting again. They kind of adapted the tools that I developed for my master thesis, you see my name is not on the bottom, so I was a little bit upset. So when I went to ETH, I wanted to show that I can do things more exciting. 
So we tried this with a more freeform example. So we use our tools to generate a geometry that had certain features that were perhaps surprising. In tile vaulting, I, I keep emphasizing that the key part is that you can build without formwork. But in this case, we wanted to prove the concept and to stick to a very carefully sculpted 3D geometry. So you, we needed some guide work to trace this geometry. So we did this with pallets and with some cardboard. And uh, because these cardboard uh, formwork, imagine banana boxes, they're designed to take 200 kilograms in their corners because they need to be stacked in containers. So this simple guide working cardboard could actually take 500 kilograms per square meter. So in that sense, we cheated them a little bit in order to have more expressive patterns that would typically not be stable if you would do it in a traditional vaulting way. But this was to emphasize again the fluidity or the more complex 3D equilibrium. This is Lara Davis, she built this shell. It's a two-layer shell. And then there where we see in the diagram, so where the lengths are longer, in the force diagram to the right, we included some hidden ribs by offsetting the intervals, the inside and the outside, not to disrupt, disrupt the flow of the patterns. And then here at the point springs, this is very until this project, this was never done for good reason. Well, that's not true. In Cuba, they did things like that. But um, because if you just have a point, all the forces need to go through this point. So you don't have double curvature, so then you need to beef up the section. So that is what we were doing there. And then this, here you see five and a half weeks of construction. It was raining all the time, so that was very painful. Alright, but I admitted already that we cheated a bit, so before even getting to this stage, actually the most critical point in a compression shell is the decentering. if you really have an unreinforced shell. So in order to do this equally, because if you decenter unequally, it's the same as loading it heavily unequally. So we wanted, uh, to, we needed a mechanism, so we tested this on, uh, with flower pots on our uh, uh, balconies. So to the left is cardboard dry, to the right cardboard wet. So we, then we thought, okay, great, let's put the entire system, scaffolding system, on these spacers in plastic tubes, and at the end, we cut them open, we put water into it, and indeed everything nicely came down, so that we could safely take out the entire form. So then there it was, so this was great for me to see, this was in 2010, 11, no, 2010 still, it was great for me to see that I didn't, in my opinion, I didn't waste my PhD uh, uh, too much, my time during my PhD, because this was for me the first larger scale um, uh, showcase of what you can do in compression mode. So again, there is no steel, there is no tricks, this is just uh, tiles stuck together, two layers, with certain parts that uh, annoy my colleagues in engineering, because they insist that there has to be tension everywhere. Okay, there it was. It was a research project, so I, of course, had no permit. ETH Immobilium was getting a little bit nervous because this was the favorite playground for very small kids to climb up and jump off and things like that in the weekend. So we needed to take it down. Um, as an amateur master builder, we needed to do some type of ghetto testing, uh, load testing. Uh, to the right, you see actually three tons of sandbags in a very very uh, patch load, very narrow point load. Uh, this typically should have done something, so I was a bit disappointed because I was hoping for a nice collapse mechanism. We tried our tools to explain why it was not uh, collapsing. <coughs> but then uh, it had to go. This is Matthias Rittmann, who actually designed this rider font, so this was exciting that he could. Uh, he could. the shell that we designed. So I recommend you to actually uh, tear down everything you built because you learn a lot about how it's standing and why it's standing. <laughs> yeah, so we don't get to do this every day. So we have full coverage of this thing. This is maybe a bit surprising. It's standing temporarily in Cantilever, but then it's uh, uh, falls down later. So of course there is some bending capacity because of the package, but it's a natural material, you are 
it's a labor, it's an arts and crafts, so you cannot count on all the properties. And the other thing that you see is that because of the good positive double curvature, how hard it is to tear down the shell, even though there is no reinforcement at all. And so even now it's still uh, standing. This to us, to all of us, was actually very eye-opening, that actually you see the, the inherent redundancy of a good uh, shape. And then, of course, at the end, uh, project is um, after this, we try to, now we have a continuous expression of tile fonts, so can we now uh, uh, go back to the ribs, can we get the ribs back in there? This is what they did with Dave Pygram from Supermaneuver uh, in Sydney. Uh, they had a lot of foam lying around, so uh, this was a design build workshop, so 10 days, the students were introduced to masonry, right of vault, they had a design charrette for 24 hours, and then we started building this with the students. So here the idea was to actually have three-dimensional interactive ribs with that in-between traditional type of vaulting. So this is more design research, it's trying to see can we propose different kind of geometries for this kind of structure. And so this was then the result built by the students. Um, but also Dave didn't buy sufficient sandbags, so we ended up trying stuff at it also. In a second iteration, you might have noticed that this is a total waste of formwork material, so this can only be a good way to do so. I wanted to go back to the roots of tile vaulting. This was in Melbourne with Tim Short and Grimshaw Architects. That's in their offices. So what we are looking at is that this shell is a three-dimensional shell where the ribs were built first, all the patches in between with traditional tile vaulting, and all the ribs are straight in plan. So this was a very constrained design example. Can you make very simple straight ribs in plan and still have a fully three-dimensional experience? Why is this important? Because here you see how it's constructed. To the scale of the structure, this seems like a lot. But imagine this is a very straightforward, very simple way of building. You just have straight little stud bones with simple uh, rib, uh, rib profiles. You first build the ribs and then the rest can be patched in, uh, in easily with traditional time folder. So when, when, you, when you would scale this up, and we might have a, a chance, we are finishing this project now to do this in Colombia, where we will do this over a span of 30 meters then you can imagine that this really reduces the forward needed. I had to go early, so I missed the party. That's a pity, because in the design, we had this very nice DJ roof, but nonetheless, uh, it, um, the picture of the great. All right, and then the last thing, this is very fresh, I just threw it in. Um, David uh, Lopez, a PhD student of mine, just came back from uh, Medellin, Colombia, where we built another shell, very simple, similar method. The cardboard is used to bend these re rebars to have a description of the surface. In this case, uh, the, the faceting mortar is not entirely uh, waterproof, so we set it in regular mortar first on the ground. And then this is basically a shell that, we, that basically is covered by green, so the walls that you see on there is to retain the grass. Um, David Lopez and his wife to the, is to the left, and his wife is next to him, are the two people that did uh, this shell in Barcelona, maybe you've seen it, by map, MAP13. They used Rhino Vault for it, and then um, uh, it was actually kind of a funny coincidence. I hired David, he used Rhino Vault to build this thing, and then he started working, and I was like, how did that happen in these two months? We, in between, I, uh, so it seems that it works, and other people are crazy enough to use our tools to build these uh, gigantic shops. So this is uh, David at work. As also the experience in Ethiopia was really exciting. Um, uh, working locally, it's great when you have these moments with these homemade tools, uh, how they adapt and uh, try to uh, learn from the, and work with uh, the new people coming in. So this was a grass, uh, a green roof. It's a permanent extension of a path in a park in, in Medellin. Um, so we, uh, this is not the thickness of the shell. This is actually, it's only a two-layer shell, but then it's um, uh, bent over to take the earth. And then these are some of the last uh, kind of images. Uh, notice the funny character to the left. He's in about half of the picture. So this Mario Bros kind of a guy seemed to like this thing or it did be in our images. So now
now it's not really looking that great, but imagine with the vines coming over entirely embedded in the grass, perhaps in a couple of months it will be a bit more convincing. All right, now the last cat uh, category is uh, this one, full form. To me, this is the most exciting one because you can go most extreme in this kind of models. The two other methods are, of course, constrained with respect to the logic of construction and stable sections. The very first one I did, it was not the one outside, but it was this one. It's still one of my favorite shells. It's a compression only shell. Why can I say this? Because these are both separate 3D printed elements without any connection or glue, so just standing in compression. So the two parts are only 2 millimeters. Also, the model is about 40, meters, uh, 40 centimeters. So we made it like this. We had this cake form, we had a puzzle. And then you flip it, you put the supports, and then you can nicely uh, uncover the shell. You can imagine that this kind of method to build your shell is not entirely scalable. We'll come back to this later. And then if you didn't believe me, so indeed it's entirely unglued. What's great about this is that uh, we started pushing there in the shell because there were the least amount of forces, so we imagined that we could take it down. And uh, for this specific geometry, there is actually a lot of force being attracted in this last part in the back. And you see that this then causes another equilibrium state. This is actually very good quality of this shell, that the local collapse doesn't propagate into a global collapse. Of course, it's a little bit unfortunate for the people to the left, but the good thing is that this is something that we want in uh, engineering. All right, but so in these kind of shells, a big challenge is how to cut up this large geometry into pieces, so this is called stereotomy. So for the new kind of geometries where you cannot, a dome, you know how to cut up a dome, a vault, you know how to cut up a vault, but if you morph from one geometry into the other, how to define where the, uh, the stores need to be. So for this we then developed a dig digital design process, an important aspect is that if you have the dominant flow of forces, you want to be as perpendicular as possible. Because if you are not perpendicular, then you might risk some sliding failure. So that might be an argument. And then also you want to generate the geometry such that it can be uh, uh, built efficiently. I'll skip this for now. So this is basically readjusting uh, according to the force input. So it's taking the force and we are still designing, so we don't want to just generate uh, uh, the perfect pattern. This kind of inter intricate tr transitions is exactly what makes it awkward sometimes, but also very uh, uh, beautiful. And so we want to have these assisted design tools. Then the last step is how to build it. This is about the most stupid way to do things in stone. It's very precise, but it is it wastes a lot of material. It is very time consuming, and you break drill bricks all the time. So this is good for sculptures. But if you want to build large things in stone, then you might want to look at, for example, these CNC controlled big blades or these wire covers. So to the right is basically hot wire covers for adults. These are large wires with di diamonds encrusted on it. And what's neat is that these geometries can often be very close, approximated with doubly wood surfaces. So we thought that the, the, the one to the right was the best solution. So we tested this geometric with our homemade CNC machine. It has five, uh, four axes, exactly the same axis as existing multi-axis wire cutters. So that's why we built this machine. And then um, the funny thing is that these kind of uh, uh, very powerful fabrication tools don't have the software. They just have an input curve, and then the wire has something in between the input curve. So we have to generate a, a design or write our own program to uh, um, generate the G-code for this, um, this process. So you see that this is all doubly ruled, so this is all done with a wire. So you can even make this interlocking, these notches at the interface. And then uh, this works. Uh, unfortunately, there is a big difference between hot wire cutter and real stone cutting. The hot wire cutter, if it's perfectly tuned, the, the foam melts just before the wire hits the foam. So that means that you have a perfect straight line. In stone cutting, of course, it's an abrasive process, so the, the wire is bending. So you don't have, you cannot guarantee the, the guarantee the tolerances that you would have geometrically. 
So that is why we decided we had to I'm building up towards a real project. We, this is the machine bought by the client and the contractor. It's a one million dollar crazy CNC machine. And we work together with them to then also optimize how to generate these stones. A big challenge in, C in CNC milling in general, but then certainly in stone, is how to reg register the piece when you flip it without having to re-scan. So how do you know where it is in a physical space? So for this, we, uh, we went to uh, this solution where we left some pieces. We put these registration marks where you know exactly where they are. And then this is flipped on some custom brackets. Then you can do the other case. So the advantage of this, imagine that you build a shell with 800 pieces. If you have to rescan that, uh, that costs a lot of money. So this would be a way to repeat pieces in a very efficient manner. All right, what's neat is that I've been working with uh, this client and uh, my colleagues at Scobedo Construction for now uh, seven years almost, so they trust me quite a bit. In extension, they trust my PhD students, so with the, with the uh, experience of the little wire cutter, we then generated this program where we could hack their machine and do some tests for the project that we will see. This is a one-third model. This is Matthias. So this is a small plate, by the way. Uh, it's uh, only uh, one meter. The larger plate that they also have is two meters, so it's a gigantically crazy and dangerous thing. <laughs> Alright, so this was the first test that we got to do. So this is for the project that perhaps some of you might have seen uh, in, at the Venice Biennale. It's now actually, um, my team is a bit annoyed that I'm here because we have the deadline this week. We are locking the geometry, so the project is really going down to engineering and construction plan. What are you looking at? Uh, it has a main span of almost 30 meters in the front. It's, a, it's an entertainment, open air, a performance area. It's only for stone. It's uh, uh, so no steel, but it's also uh, dry stone, so it's without any mortar. So for this, we need to really control uh, the geometry. So this is a little movie showing the process. It is actually using RhinoVolt, which we share for free. Well, this was the initial stage, now we are doing it with more sophisticated methods. One of the advantages of Rhino Vault is that if you were just, so the force distribution to the right corresponds to a more hanging form. So, but then you would have this typical problem with compressive shells that you get a Teletubby house or like a, a Hobbit kind of house. So, Rhino Vault allows you to redistribute forces to get to certain effects, like for example, these arches are opening up so that you invite people in. Um, yeah, let me follow the movie perhaps. Uh, so you take the flow of forces to have all the lines as perpendicular as possible, and then all these geometries are such that the interfaces are flat cuts. Because flat cuts is the most precise to basically control the tolerances. I had uh, two MIT research interns for the summer, so that's great. I had some little model building slaves. It took four hours to make this model out of 800 pieces. And then we decentered the model very uh, e equally. This is actually how it will done, uh, be done uh, in the real structure. We're working with this, uh, on this with Perry systems. But you see these opening edges. This is a hint at uh, Heinz Isler, but now done in stone. Uh, there is also a little homage to Fraioto in there. This, Typical drop uh, uh, openings again. So we made this movie because of what is coming up. This was then exhibited uh, at the Biennale, but we didn't want that the first visitor would make this structure collapse. I could not put my students there continuously to rebuild it continuously. So we had to glue it, but to emphasize that it is a real structural model. Remember, the small scale is very similar to the behavior of the large scale. Uh, don't worry, by the way, this is equivalent to Godzilla jumping on one leg on the edge of your shell. John Oxenor says that unreinforced masonry is there to stay for 10,000 years, so maybe Godzilla might come back. But uh, then what might happen is the following. What you did notice, though, is how much this structure can be formed before it actually uh, comes down. 
So the client was indeed excited, or he believed my story that this was a very convincing structural model. Nonetheless, he asked to send this movie without this part because he was sure that the city of Austin might get a little bit nervous when they saw this. The, this is actually not a point guard, but a shake test. But in Austin, you have no chance for earthquakes, so this would not happen. This might happen if you build this kind of stuff in Turkey. What you do notice, though, is uh, a huge disaster. That is that a local collapse, a local failure, causes a total collapse. So that is exactly how we are in redesigning the shell, to have this redundancy in there. So it's, we have a balance between continuity, fluidity of the shape, but strict, still structural, independent uh, shells. All right, and then thanks, uh, the architects, for the invitation. Yeah, we were next to the studio work, right? But to clarify, this was not the Zara project. So that is what I showed you, and I am uh, pushing my time, I guess, on, uh, a little bit. But so what I wanted to show you is by truly trying to understand why these beautiful historic structures are standing, uh, what you can do in pure masonry. So I have mainly focused uh, during my uh, tenure track at UTH, I've focused on masonry not only because I like the, the, the kind of new things you can do with a very traditional old or low-tech material, but also because my specialty is actually form finding and structural optimization. And on the computer you can do anything. So you can juggle with shapes and you can generate exciting things, you can 3D print them, you can do all these things. If you do this in masonry, unreinforced, certainly the ones that have no room whatsoever, if it has a stupid form, it will collapse. So that is another thing that I love about working in masonry, is that there is no redundancy, so you really need to know what you're doing. Okay, but I promised that I wanted to try to uh, tease you that this is beyond masonry, that if you understand good 3D equilibrium, if you understand good structural form, then you can do exciting things beyond the literal translation of uh, the stone masters. So first let's see about designing faults with little or low quality material. There I actually went back to the tile, the tile vaulting system of the Costinium Venus. We already used this in Ethiopia. But what now if you uh, do this with a modern material, for example a fiber reinforced concrete that, is, uh, that has much more uh, uh, perform uh, better performance for local uh, stress concentrations. Um, we actually then built this system. This is actually a finica, a compression only system for a typical floor. So this is a one prototype for a, a project that I will show you that will go into construction in a year, in Zurich actually. And uh, what you're looking at is this is a, a, an unreinforced shell, so there is only fiber to, to take local stress distributions. But so it's a two centimeter shell with two centimeter stickers. So imagine this as a replacement to, to a typical floor where in uh, most countries in the world you still have about 25-30 centimeters for a typical unit. That is because in bending you need to keep the rebar away, you need the structural depth. On top of that you need the three and a half centimeters to protect the rebar from corrosion and fire and so on and so on. If you build without any tension, then you don't, you can go as thin as you dare to go. And so that is what we're doing here. So how does it work? How is that possible? Well, of course, you need to take the trust at the corners. So this will, in this structural model, be done with tension pads. But in a regular frame structure, you can just replace any floor within this frame. And in the frame, you need to then design your tension pads. So the live loads, so the non-uniform loads, are basically taken in pure compress uh, compression in the system of rips. So this is done with a modified version for Rhino Vault. Now you can link it to Grasshopper to update geometry. You can have an externalized optimization loop. And so that is how we did this. Because it's not just a six singular form finding, but we really need to take all the loading cases into account. And then in the project, what I think will be nice is that you will have the hint on the inside that this is not a regular form, but this has perhaps this faceted, this diamond kind of uh, shape, uh, gives a hint that this is something special. 
All right, a critical analysis of historic faults. How can we learn from this? I'll give an example of shell structures. This is a beautiful one by Eastman. Shells are pretty good structures. Here you see a premium carrying 500 times its self-weight in a very bad loading condition uh, case. So this is a bit gimmicky, but it shows you that a good double curvature uh, is a good form. We don't see that many shells. Um, you have the experience with, of course, the Rolex Center. The, it's the formwork is very extensive, very expensive, a lot of material. Uh, very complicated, so here you see two examples by Toyoito to the left and the rationalized example of Candela with the straight lines, right? So you could do it more efficient, but still look how much material. So for this we designed a new system. It's a, a new type of fabric framework a system where you combine it with cables, with pre-stressed cable nets. Um, what is the link? Well, so it seems like this has nothing to do with masonry. Well, actually it has a lot to do with what we do in masonry because in the entire process of designing these shells, we first do structural optimization to get a good shell structure. That is our target geometry. And then in order to be able to build it, we basically uh, calculate all the pre-stress forces necessary in all the cables such that under the self-weight of the concrete, it deflects and hits exactly the target that you designed it for. So that gives you a combination between lightweight forward and exactly the geometry control even beyond what Candela could do because he was stuck to high power shapes and we know from structural optimization that if you change, in this case a single high power just locally a little bit, it improves the capacity of the shell significantly. So what is the relation? Here we need to find for a target geometry a tension only solution for the formwork um, and in the compressive shells we will find a compression only solution that stays within the geometry of the shell. So it's using exactly the same tools as the ones where we analyze the historic shells but now the dual problem. Alright, so we tested this first a little bit hands on playing around. We saw that it was not really behaving as the theory did, our algorithm proposed something else. So then we did it a bit more precise with photogrammetry for geometry control and then tensiometers for tension control. We did some nice cutting pattern. And uh, of course this is not a compression shell, right? We have dominant compression in one direction and dominant tension in the other direction. So we use this new type of text, well it's not new, but uh, textile revealing. So these uh, textile reinforcements. And then what's nice about the results is that you have the expression of the global shape. This is a very simple one. Then you have the leftover of how it was constructed. And then you'll see this later when you zoom in, you see really the material, the texture of the fabric used. As structural nerds, you have to snap on your stuff. Then I went to work with my same friends in Texas to blow it up. But more importantly, to actually do this with very standard formwork uh, uh, elements. So this is the typical, the yellow stuff is all the berry systems. The, the beige one is the typical concrete shoring element. So we wanted to go larger. So the, the only thing that needed to be custom made for this specific form is the cable net, very cheap, is the, is the, the edge condition. So again, we control both geometry and forces to be as comparable as possible to uh, our predictions. Uh, the fabric used is a geotextile. This is a Propex, it's one of the methods that Mark West, if you know him from Manitoba, uses. And then what's great about working with these uh, crafts, so I like this this relation between high-tech, like the most advanced algorithms and form-finding approaches, with then uh, this very uh, manual kind of uh, work. These are highly skilled uh, Mexican laborers. They have done that for more than 30 years. This was great to see them do this. And so they can finish these lovely curved things as if it's uh, easy. Perhaps the right gives you a hint that this was not in Switzerland. And then this is uh, the shell that we, it's a prototype that we are uh, doing for a project. So um, here to the left you see what I wanted to do. Uh, fabric framework to me, I associate it with exploration, with kind of clumsy, uh, cluttery kind of things, mainly in academia. 
I wanted to show that you can use Fabric Formwork to really do uh, high performance, very precise uh, structural shots. So you see the very careful edge control, but then on the inside you have the expression of the fabric, where when you zoom in you get this almost snake skin kind of thing. So why are we doing these things? Uh, because we have a chance to, in Nest, this is a project uh, of the ETH domain at MPAM, um, where they have uh, basically an open source platform with large cantilevering rooms, uh, forts, where different research modules can be input. So we have a chance to directly build our latest ideas. So we are on the top. So the innovation that I am responsible for is this roof. It's not the final design, but the idea is to be ex as expressive as possible, but still a very expressive shell, uh, a very efficient shell. And then the ultra lightweight floor will be the in between floor. But now what's neat about pushing the limits, so basically going to a new constructional system in order to achieve the thinnest shell possible in a very efficient way is that now, together with my colleague Anna Schluter, who is in sustainable building systems, we're using this two centimeter shell as a very large kind of surface, a large radiator that helps us to with low energy, so low temperature heating and cooling. So we install a hydronic system onto this, uh, onto this roof we have this very efficient uh, aerogel insulation, and then on top we have this thin film that is a new type of thin film for photovoltaic. So at the end of the day, 85% of this shell will be only 2 centimeters of structure and altogether insulating, heat generating, and electricity generating 7 centimeters on average. So that is what we'll uh, be doing in, um, in, in Zurich. So this to me uh, becomes excited because now it's not a forced in interdisciplinary uh, collaboration, but the innovation in construction leads to structural uh, performance and that can then be used to have new types of uh, energy uh, heating and cooling. You see that the floor has something similar, there we will actually also use the cavities, the hollow floor to also throw, have the ventilation go through there. Uh, there I just quickly want to say why is this, why I think this is relevant is because if you go to places like in Singapore, because they just layer all the systems on top of each other, some of these in-between floors are two meters deep, so even some two, uh, two meters eighty, I heard an example, and uh, if you can condense this, so if you can make this much more efficient, this of course helps a lot. You gain one floor every three floors, and of course the foundations are much higher. Alright, and then uh, the expression, um, instead of always having these shells coming down, like this Teletubby house, as I said, why not having the arch cut in two, have two half arches and then a tension time, okay, that's a single scheme in 2D, let's now blow it up in 3D, so we have a, a hidden extension in Rhinofall that allows that to include a running tension time on the bottom, and then within the compression realm you get some other interesting boundary conditions. So you can start to balance shells. Again, this is only initial form finding. This would, particularly this one, would not necessarily be a good shell. All right. But so to show this pro uh, process, we made this model. It's actually a, a very extreme structural model. Why? Because this is not, not a structure at all. It is made out of mechanisms. It's not triangulated. It's all separate pieces, and it's pure compression on the inside. It's just this piece without any glue, and then one tension tie on the outside. So that is a very careful model to assemble. And then, there we go, just to show that we are not cheating in heat. So the person saying fantastic is the great Chris Williams, who designed did the structure design and engineering of the glass roof in the British court in London. Alright, so I just want to emphasize this is not meant to be a structure, right? But imagine that under, for example, the self-weight or the dominant weight of the shell, you have pure compression on the inside and pure tension on the outside, then of course you still need to stiffen it for life weight. But then at least in its self-weight state, it's taking these loads very efficiently. And so what we're doing in another project, I cannot show you yet because it's not there yet, is to design to do this with tile vaulting. So 
that you can build this expressive form by itself. The time voting takes the download component of the weight uh, of the loading, and the live loading is taken by an extremely thin uh, concrete shell that is underdimensioned as a shell, but that is dimensioned only to take the live load. So that basically the forces, the force distribution is forced to count on the tile shell to take the download component. So these are the kind of things that we're trying to do to really push structural efficiencies. And then the new graphical methods. Uh, we have done this in 3D, but I will not go into detail. Now we can do fully spatial structures. Any of these structures are pure compression. We can do multi-layer, we can do aggregates and all of that. And so these three structures can now really be molded and shifted and, and, and uh, tweaked in 3D. And this by aggregation instead of force vector polygons, we now do spatial force polygons. Uh, polyhedra. And so this polyhedra represents nodal equilibrium, and by aggregating, we can do this very expressive compression, tension on the kind of new type of structure. Okay, and allow me to perhaps make a little bit of self promotion. If you're at all interested in any of this, we have this awesome book that just came out with a lot of uh, fairly well known shell builders and designers um, that are very generously sharing all, all form finding and many of the optimization methods available in shells and also for example Mutsuru Sasaki explains in a lot of detail how he did several of his shells and uh, you see that we were lucky that the last Pritzker Prize winner wrote uh, a little forward so that was a, a nice luck. Um, if you're interested then let me know, we have a discount code and you can get it. Uh, Alright, uh, but that's it, thanks for coming to my lecture and not to the fashion show. Um, I'm putting uh, my, uh, my website on because uh, all our papers are freely downloadable on our website. That's where you can find Rhino Vault. Much more detail about any of these projects. So if you want to know the details of how we did these things, we describe everything, which is not a good business strategy, but you can find everything on our, on our website. But thanks again for your attention, and I'm very happy to take any questions. system and introduces a uh, construction method of saying something like the, the shell would be completely 3D printed in that whole house, uh, a, a, a whole structure, uh -huh. uh, would it begin to uh, fix some of the problems that you've seen in the last um, uh, structure that you made where if you break off a piece, will it because it's not piling, it's more... Yeah, so the last structure, it was not a structure, it was a structural model, so um, you would not want to build it out of discrete pieces, out of separate, separate, uh, separate elements. But about the tree printing, what's, what's... I thought you were going in another direction, that is that the tree printing also, these are more happy, certain the powder bases are more happy in compression and in tension, some bending capacity with the matrix that glues all the particles together. Right? But um, so people like Enrico Dini are starting to go in more com compression kind of uh, ways to scale their things up. Um, but about continuity, yes, indeed, the last structure, if you were to translate this, one way to stiffen your structure to live is just to make all the joints into moment connections. And so you would make them in stiff connections. So if you were to 3D print this, yes, but it would still be fairly limited.
there, there, this is not about efficiency. This is actually, um, this is to me a very dramatic showcase of, um, of honesty in a way, because it's uh, directly taking material and putting it up there. It's kind of showing that without any redundancy, you can do something exciting. Uh, if you really understand all the constraints, so it's more about a very dramatic, perhaps a little bit, uh, now that you ask it like that, perhaps a little bit perverse kind of uh, showing that if you know where the forces need, uh, want to go, you don't need to have a substructure to then carry a, 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 an expression that all of this can go together hand in hand. So in that sense it's like that. But um, yeah, so this more, I mean, the client also specifically is interested in a landmark for the city even, a landmark for the entire development that is happening. Um, uh, so this is not about that, but then still within these constraints, uh, this shell is not going to be uh, exuberantly expensive, you might imagine that, but that is because all, all along all the steps are optimized. Uh, but fair enough, uh, this is not the best way uh, to do things. I think in stone cutting, like uh, this was used for cathedrals, for large, uh, in India they built this, this 88 meter dome, and this is for uh, also a religious kind of yare uh, place and all of that. So these are more for sacral or kind of a, a landmark or memorials or things like that. Um, so I don't think you can optimize this much more. What you can do is um, go back to the more rudimentary techniques, the other ones that I showed, the more uh, artisanal ones. Um, you could start to imagine some repetition in shapes but uh, that actually for stone doesn't make too much sense because each stone needs to be cut anyways. So that is why uh, it's also okay to do, it, uh, to do this. Um, but actually just as, a, as an expression or as a demonstrator, if you were to do this as a grid shell or as a concrete shell, then you can go much, much thinner and you don't need to have all this weight in this material and all of that. So this is more a demonstrator of shape, of shape expression. It's still uh, within the very, very rigorous constraint of efficiency. Exactly, actually, one of the reasons that these structures are still there is that uh, I call them, to my students, I call them happy structures, they're nice in compression. A beautiful example is if you know the Kresge Auditorium at MIT, it is a tree, a shell rested on three points, but it's not a structural form, so it's deforming a lot, it doesn't want to be in this shape, so the roofing needs to be replaced every so many years. And then if you go to Switzerland and you see the shells by Heinz Isler in a very harsh climate, they're just painted because they're nicely kept in pure compression, so they're, they're finicular shells. And they don't look that different. The one is an eighth of an orange. The, uh, the, the Isler shells are a pure shell. It's the inverse of the hanging form. So that nicely keeps everything in compression. So they're actually the steel. I mean, the steel will at a certain point corrode, but it, at least the concrete is kept together. Because bending only works as soon as there is cracks, and so it's doomed to corrode at a certain point. So the, your point is entirely right, that that is why we are lucky to still have Greek temples until 
people decide to reinforce them with a titanium rod inside and then they break uh, afterwards. So it's, it, there is a lot of value not only for the, for the energy, for example, that goes into making steel and all the grey the gray energy and things like that, but also the longevity. So that is why uh, John is was my John Oxenberg, was my PhD advisor, but also partner in, in a little excuse of the firm that we have. He says that we are designing this for the next 10,000 years. It's maybe a bit exaggerated, but it has to do with uh, the lack of steel that has, uh, that has stress concentrations, that wants to corrode, that wants to not uh, be on. Why don't we build like that? I think uh, with a new material, there is a fascination of new possibilities that you could build a straight beam. Uh, that you could do these other things, you, we don't all want to have this fault and uh, shape, so I guess that has something to do with it. But I also sense that now is the moment to introduce this kind of knowledge back into the current uh, language. And you all, those that are in the, or know of the studio of Hadith and, and many of the recent works of the Hadith architecture, this expression of shells is, is very hot right now, so why not? It's very close by, so why not do extremely efficient. And that is not only them, so it's also uh, Foster Apartments, Grimshaw, and so on and so on are doing that. But can I add one more thing to that? Actually, another nice thing is now that, so I showed you a very, because I like the purity of unreinforced masonry, but I'm not an unreinforced masonry guy. You could now take this and build, for example, a lost formwork out of a compressive shell to build your regular concrete shell on top of it and use that as then a beautiful tile cladding. And so you can start to do also some combinations between crafts and, and, and history and then novel expressions in shells. Sorry, Brian. No, sorry. Uh, I tried to wind up uh, by using a set of time or it's the right time to now to introduce this. And uh, the, the time is changing very quickly, I have to say. When I started here 20 years ago, I was asked, why do you show these shells, Candela shells? Okay. <laughs> and I said, that, wait a moment. This, this means to keep uh, recruiting, yeah. Yeah, to bring recruiting. And the time changed very quickly. Uh, now we build again these concrete uh, shells, as you know, reinforced shells. And that's why, why I think, and I have to congratulate you to that work, it's very important to go a step back, not to uh, a step back uh, beyond Candela, beyond Europa, and look what would have what could have be or what can be developed uh, with our brain or with our brain. Yeah. Um, well, thanks. Yeah, that's exactly what I tried to do. So that's, um, that's great. Um, yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't know. Are there any more questions or comments? I have nice ones like this are, are greatly appreciated. So, yes, please. Thank you for the lecture. It's really necessary to say it in the way you did that the compression system based on the compression based system is a uh, super useful and developing system. And uh, I think that many students understood your lecture in relation to the question what is form that is developed by some processes and what is form that uh, is created as a trust or as a hardware by itself. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks also for pointing that out. Uh, my, my point is, is that I hope that I have triggered or challenged or kind of interested some of you to show that even without, within constraints, you can do constraints give you this design. I just want to question. It's a city Yes.
I understand. I, I'm, I'm actually not criticizing. I'm just trying to show that certain of these expressions, these structural expressions that I'm trying to demonstrate, not only digitally, but also through building some of these, that they are reasonably close to what artists or and that's why I use the Sarian example, because this three-pointed support shell, if it's an eighth of an orange or slightly different and then a pure, very efficient structure, it's not that much different. Okay, maybe I'm trying to shake it around there, but my point is I, I, I'm trying to show that even within the constraint of pure structural efficiency, so not other kind of measures, that it can uh, be very expressive. And so I hope that these kind of methods, but also I'm not alone in this, but perhaps I'm more dramatic because I stick to masonry and stone, but there's many new tools in form finding and, 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 and uh, structurally informed kind of design is, is there's many ways to do this, and I just want to show through my extremeness uh, that that yes, let's do that because we might really narrow the gap, and at a certain point, the artists then might say that ah, this little bit there might not be that relevant if I can uh, build it with ten times less material, for example. And this is again not a judgment. This is also not necessarily what I think everything should be like that. It should be should not all build cathedrals, we should not all build shells and so on and so on, but I just hope to narrow the gap. I think this would already be a great job because I think we're very close, very close in forms at least, formally. Yeah. I don't know. Thank you very much. Alright, thanks.